The ancient forests of China in the mid-Jurassic, a time when the stegosaurs and the sauropods have come to dominate the land. Some have achieved massive sizes like Omiosaurus, an incredible long-necked genus that can reach lengths of 20 meters and weigh 10 tons. But not all are giants, though by today's standards they are still massive. Shunosaurus are one of the smaller species of sauropod, reaching 9 meters long and weighing 3 tons. They also have rather short necks, making them very different to the Amiosaurus they share their forest home with. To make up for their smaller size, Shunosaurus live in large herds for protection, and once they reach a certain size, there are very few predators that can harm them. Though they spend much of their time marching through the thick forests, today a herd are making their way to a local lake to drink. As they file up to the water, they are wary. This would be a perfect spot for predators to wait in ambush. Despite that, almost all animals need to visit here. As each one takes in their fill, they then move to the closest vegetation to feed. Shunosaurus are not picky eaters, their spatulate-shaped teeth are thick and tough, perfect for shearing tough plant matter, and then passing it straight into their gut. Their skulls are proportionally larger than most sauropods, and they have a wide gape, allowing them to scoff down huge mouthfuls at a time. As they forage anything they can reach, the herd is joined by a smaller herd of Omiosaurus that walk up to the lake and begin the long process of lowering their heads down to drink. Once the giants have quenched their thirst, they move to feed, and inevitably end up mingling with the Shunosaurus. The size difference means that the Omiosaurus can attain leaves that the Shunosaurus could never hope to reach. In fact, adult Omiosaurus can stand right behind the Shunosaurus and feed directly over them. But this isn't always the case. Sometimes the largest sauropods want to get to a particular tree, and if the Shunosaurus are in the way, they better move out of the giant's path, or the Omiosaurus will push them out of the way, or even kick them if necessary. More and more of the Shunosaurus are forced to move on to different trees and ferns, as the belligerent Omiosaurus walk right through their herd, as if they aren't even there. Even younger Omiosaurus hassle their smaller neighbours, when juvenile members that are around the same size as the adult Shunosaurus mix herds, they have no quarrel with pushing the Shunosaurus aside so they can feed on particular plants. For whatever reason, the Shunosaurus don't fight back, don't get angered, and don't try and strong arm these intrusive youngsters. They simply find another place to feed and resume chomping down as much as they can. Perhaps they fear what the adult Amiosaurus would do if they harassed their younger individuals. Or they may simply be some of the most patient neighbours. Either way, violence between these two species has rarely occurred. But where there's a gathering of prey, predators are bound to show up eventually. And violence, in some form, is inevitable. Calls come out from the edge of the Shunosaurus herd, and soon all species know that they are under attack. The unlucky individuals have been set upon by a pack of Yuchuangosaurus, 8 meter super predators that are one of the few carnivores large enough and powerful enough to threaten even an adult Shunosaurus. Three of them moved up to attack the sauropods, and those members close to them hurried to get back to the rest of the herd, but they weren't defenseless however. At the end of their tails they had a hard bony club, similar to the more famous ankylosaurs, and just like them, they can use these weapons to strike at predators. One Shunosaurus holds back, looking over his shoulder at the oncoming Yangchuanosaurus, before flexing his tail, ready to fight. One of the predators runs towards the lone herbivore, and the Shunosaurus swings his tail, aiming for the carnivore's face. The Yangchuanosaurus ducks under the attack and moves forward, but the sauropod's return swing manages to hit home. The tail club smacks across the carnival's upper jaw, and he reels back for a moment. Unfortunately, the second swing wasn't nearly as powerful as the first, and by the time the Shunosaurus swings his tail again, the Yangchuanosaurus has recovered and bites into the herbivore's tail at the base of the club. 
Both animals growl in anger and pain, and each tries to pull the other, sinking their feet into the sand. The other two Yang Chuanosaurus reach the rest of the herd, and come face to face with a wall of adults. The predators snap at them, while the herbivores rise up on their back legs, and try to stomp down on their attackers, or kick them with their forelegs. One lands too far forward, and a female Yang Chuanosaurus seizes the opportunity by grabbing its neck and her jaws. Her teeth puncture its hide, and as the victim shakes its head and neck to break free, it only worsens the wounds. Suddenly, the Shunosaurus herd part aside, and both predators look up and see the massive bulk of a full-grown Omiosaurus walking towards them. The Titan rears up on its hind legs, takes two steps forward, and slams down on the ground where the third Yangchuanosaurus was standing moments before. Not wanting to get crushed to death, the two carnivores break off their attack and begin to retreat, the loud calls of the Shunosaurus echoing behind them. The male Yang Chuanosaurus that had been wrestling with the lone Shunosaurus saw his pack mates falling back, and with one mighty pull, rips the end of the sauropod's tail clean off before turning and running as well. The wounded Shunosaurus joins his herd, now with his main form of defense completely gone. He and the female that got her neck bitten will stick close to the center of the herd till their injuries heal but all are grateful for the timely arrival of the Omiosaurus, who prove that while sometimes they can be in an annoyance, as a group, they are all safer together. Hello fellow travelers and welcome back. Today we will be breaking down the club-tailed sauropod, Shunosaurus. Shunosaurus' first remains were discovered in China in 1977 by a group of paleontology students, and would later be described in 1983, given the name Shunosaurus Lii, named after the ancient name for the Shuan province where it was found, being Shu. This first find belongs to the lower Xingxi Miao Formation, and since then, over 20 individuals have been found, including some with near-complete skeletons. Overall, we have about 95% of Shunosaurus' skeleton, making it one of the most well-understood sauropods, at least from an anatomical view. It should be noted that a second species was named in 2004, from Yumon County, and given the name Shunosaurus jingaiensis, as it was from older rocks, was larger and had a differently shaped pectoral girdle, but was otherwise very similar. Since the first species is known from so much more material, most information in this video will relate to Shunosaurus lii. It lived in the middle to late Jurassic between 161 and 157 million years ago, a time when China was covered in thick forests. In 2010, Gregory S. Paul estimated Shunosaurus to measure 9.5 meters long, stand 4 meters tall at the hip, and weigh 3 tons. By today's standards, it's a massive animal, but by sauropod standards, it's actually on the small end. But Shunosaurus has many traits that make it stand out. For one, it has the second shortest neck of any sauropod, in comparison to body length. For the record, the only one with a shorter neck is the odd-looking Brachytrapalopan from Argentina. Shunosaurus' head may have been this length because its head was quite large for its size. Sauropods are famous for having tiny and lightly built heads on the end of their necks, and this was so the skull didn't weigh down or strain the neck. Shunosaurus' skull is a bit different, being quite robust, high, and rounded. Both upper and lower jaws curved upwards, meaning that when used in feeding, they acted like garden shears. Inside the jaws, it had up to 25 long and thick teeth that got up to 8 centimeters in length, being cylindrical in shape with a spatulate-shaped crown. These were very robust and went further back along the jaws than most other sauropods. This does not mean they chewed their food, but shows they were capable of a wide gape, allowing them to take big mouthfuls of food and snap it off with a combination of their strong teeth and shearing jaws. From the animal's height and the ability to tackle tough vegetation, Shunosaurus is thought to have been a generalist browser, 
feeding on everything from ground level ferns to leaves and trees, chowing down on anything it could reach. With that being said, young Shunosaurus did not have as robust a skull as their parents, and they may have fed on softer plant life before they grew larger and were able to tackle tougher and taller food sources. As we can see, Shunosaurus had very long forelimbs, making it able to stand more upright than more typical horizontal sauropods like Diplodocus and Apatosaurus, helping it to hold itself tall so that it could reach down and feed on low-lying plants, but also have no trouble lifting its head up to acquire food out of reach of smaller dinosaur families, like the stegosaurs it lived with. The most well-known part of Shunosaurus's anatomy is its signature tail club, it is easy to compare this structure to those known from the ankylosaur family, but there are some key differences. Ankylosaur clubs are comprised of osteoderms, which are bones in the body that are connected to the skeleton. Shunosaurus's club is made out of several fused tail vertebra, along with two osteoderms that grew into 5 cm long spikes on top of the club. So you're not only getting blunt force trauma when hit by this thing, you are also getting puncture wounds. Though it's likely that this weapon first of all to be used in intraspecific combat, such as males fighting each other for dominance, there's no doubt that Shunosaurus would have also used it to defend itself against predators. The rest of the tail was made up of regular vertebra, so it was still strong and flexible, allowing Shunosaurus to swing its club in wide arcs like a flail with a spiked end. And given the size of Shunosaurus, it was probably very powerful. It's easy to see these sauropods slamming the ends of their tails into the heads or necks of any predators large enough to threaten them. So did any other sauropods have tail clubs? Well, maybe. Partial remains of both Amiosaurus and Mementisaurus suggest that they may have had tail clubs of their own. However, there is very little remains of these two, so more concrete evidence is needed to confirm that they had them. So why didn't other sauropods evolve such a defense? Shunosaurus itself isn't closely related to Amiosaurus and Mementisaurus, but Amiosaurus and Mementisaurus are both in the Mementisauridae family. Not only that, they all lived in the same area, but at slightly different times. Each is also a more basal species than the other later sauropods, from the late Jurassic onwards. Perhaps tail clubs originally evolved only in species native to China due to some environmental influence, or tail clubs are a trait specific to more basal species that more dry species lost or never had in the first place. So where does Shunosaurus go on the sauropod family tree? Well, despite having so much of it to work with, scientists can't quite seem to place it. In 2002, Geoffrey Winston placed it in the Eurosauropoda clade at a very basal level, and it's thought that its closest known relative may be Rhoetosaurus from Australia. Shunosaurus lived in an area that was heavily forested with many lakes and rivers, and this may explain why it was so small, as moving around in such a dense environment would have been a lot harder the larger you were. From the original location it was discovered in, Shunosaurus made up 90% of the species found, showing that it was quite common, and likely lived in large herds. So, Shunosaurus, a sauropod that shows us the diversity of the sauropod family, from its feeding habits to its defensive abilities. But what do you think of Shunosaurus? And for my question of the week, how accurate do you think it was with its tail club? As sauropods weren't known for their high intelligence. Let me know what lesser known dinosaur you'd like me to do a breakdown on next, and until then, please like, share, subscribe, and thank you for watching.